From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO, our podcast centered on all things related to living with neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. I'm Chelsea, scientific advisor with the CBJF and your host. So last episode, we followed along with Dr. Kaplan, a neurology associate professor at Harvard Medical School and also practicing neurologist at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Kaplan shared her knowledge and tips on working through sexual dysfunction in NMO. I was so grateful to have such a candid discussion with her on a subject that, quite frankly, doesn't get talked about nearly enough. I'm even more grateful that I get to chat with her again, um, and this time with her colleague, Dr. Kristen Galetta, another physician at Brigham Women's and also associated with Harvard Medical School. Both doctors Kaplan and Galetta and I talk about family planning or pregnancy and NMO, which I think is a really natural progression of our last episode on sex. Once again, this can be a touchy subject because choosing to become pregnant is, of course, a very personal, complex decision for anyone, and of course can be even more complex when you're managing uh, something so severe and difficult like an NMO diagnosis. And while there are a lot of intricacies and big discussions to consider, Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Galetta reminded me that people living with NMO do not have to limit their dreams or their family size if they so choose. They emphasize the importance of communication with your healthcare provider so that you can chart the best, most appropriate path for yourself if you're living with NMO and considering becoming pregnant or find yourself pregnant. Before we begin, just a quick refresher and disclaimer that this podcast and information that we provide should not be used in place of consultation with your healthcare provider. This isn't, is not medical advice. I'm so grateful that we're able to share this information, which I hope and do believe can help empower NMO patients and caregivers to make the most informed clinical decisions, but clinical decisions that are shared with your healthcare provider. And now, with that out of the way, I'm delighted to dive into this episode on managing pregnancy while also navigating NMO. Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Galetta, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. This is a really important topic for us to focus on, considering that pregnancy obviously affects women, and NMO is something that predominantly affects women. What are the stats again on that? Yeah, you're right, Chelsea. It is more common in women. With people who have aquaporin-4 type of NMO, it's 9 to 1, so much more common in women, and still more common in women in the MOG type disease as well. And as you pointed out, it's common in women, and it's also very common in women of childbearing age. So mm-hmm. the median age of people who are presenting with NMO is actually 39. So this is such a relevant topic. Wow. And I can imagine that for a woman or just a family that's affected by NMO considering starting a family or they become pregnant while um, having NMO or on a treatment, that that could be really scary. Yeah, I think I think it can be. But the good news is that women with NMO can have successful pregnancies and deliveries. It just requires a, a little bit more planning and a lot of coordination with, with your healthcare provider and maybe a, your healthcare team. Mm. Um, and, and one thing to note, too, is that nearly half of all pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. So, you know, patients should be having these discussions with their doctor from day one because that might have implications for what disease-modifying therapy they choose and, and their healthcare provider chooses to start them on. I think that's really reassuring. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. And I did not realize that stat on unplanned pregnancies was so high, 50%. And I think that you make a really good point about keeping an open and honest dialogue with your healthcare provider so that you can have this option to become pregnant or to manage pregnancy. And the truth is, honestly, I ask my patients at every single visit, you know, are you planning to become pregnant within the next year? Because it is, it's something that, that doctors and patients should dialogue about. I think that's so important. Thank you. I hear a lot in the MS or multiple sclerosis field, this idea potentially that pregnancy can be protective from disease activity. Does that hold true for NMO? So in, in this respect, MS and NMO are actually quite different, but there are a few similarities. So mm-hmm. in general with MS, we think that pre- 
pregnancy is actually somewhat protective, and a lot of patients do not have relapses during pregnancy, specifically second and third trimester. But there is potentially a slight increased risk of relapse within the first three months postpartum. But that's quite different in, in NMO. Yeah, it, actually in NMO, some case theories say there are increased risk of relapse, especially the first trimester. Mm. And some case theories say that it's about the same as their pre-pregnancy relapse rate. But overall, we take this to mean that the risk of relapsing is about the same as prior to pre-pregnancy and or increase compared to prior to pregnancy as a compared to MS, as Dr. Kaplan said, which is decreased during pregnancy. Definitely, there's a difference from MS. Definitely. And there's high rates of relapse postpartum in patients with NMO. So both do have higher rates of relapse after pregnancy and maybe higher in NMO. One thing that I just want to add, though, importantly, is a lot of this data about postpartum relapse comes from case theories and, and, and things from the past where patients may not necessarily have been on disease-modifying therapy. So now that we have the ability to, to resume therapy soon after delivery, these things might change, but we don't have the data yet. This is an evolving field. Really interesting. And I'm guessing that we don't fully have the answers to this question, but I'm assuming that with pregnancy comes changes in hormones and that that could potentially have a role or contribution in disease activity during pregnancy? Yes. Well, all we, we can tell you is that we know estrogen affects the brain in various different ways, and we're still sort of figuring out how this all works. Thank you for that. I hear a bit of noise or some confusion about how NMO could potentially affect fertility. Do we have any information on that in either women or in men with NMO? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think we really don't have enough information to say either way. There was a case series that reported that the rate of need for IVF was 6% among patients with NMO, mm -hmm. but it's hard to know what that means because many of the patients in that case series were actually older and had already had children. Uh. Additionally, there's some case reports that maybe the ability to get pregnant is lower, but they're really not substantiated and there's not enough data from the female perspective. And from the male perspective, also not, not really there's been no information about this. There may be some suggestion about disease modifying therapy affecting fertility amongst men, but this is extrapolated from other diseases. Interesting. So just a lot of factors in that to tweeze out, and obviously we need more data. Yeah, I really don't think we have enough information to say much about fertility. And then... As clinicians, is this something if patients, obviously, like if they are struggling or have issues, they're probably talking with you, their neurologist or their OBGYN, looking for guidance or help on this? Yeah, I think the other wonderful resource is um, reproductive endocrinologists. One of the factors with getting pregnant and, and fertility is not just whether fertility itself, but how long the patient needs to be off disease-modifying mm. therapy, because a lot of patients will want to discontinue therapy while attempting to conceive. And that can have repercussions too. And so oftentimes, you know, we may work with a reproductive endocrinologist to help expedite the process. And those are the doctors that can really help with, with infertility. And there's so many things that, that we can do now to help women who want to get pregnant. Because infertility is actually defined as not being able to get pregnant within a year, mm -hmm. but that may just be too long to wait in some cases. So we may collaborate with reproductive endocrinologists in these, in these cases. So I'm taking two takeaway points from that. One, I'm going to kind of lump together collaboration and communication. So communicating with your healthcare providers and then potentially collaborating with other specialists, including these reproductive endocrinologists. And then two, it seems like timing is really important so that you're able to protect yourself from disease activity of NMO with appropriate DMT or disease modifying treatment, but also making sure the timing is just right so that you're safe to get pregnant. That's absolutely right. And and timing means something different depending on what modifying therapy the patient may be on. And not all disease modifying therapies are created mm -hmm. equal when it comes to risk in pregnancy. So some of the therapies that we use may be perfectly fine during pregnancy. For example, rituximab is a, is a medication that a lot of patients are on. And there's been a, quite a few case series looking at rituximab during pregnancy and, and just before. And the, the major effects that we've seen if rituximab was administered late during pregnancy, was the newborns were born with transiently low cells mm -hmm. that seemed to recover within a couple weeks. But there was no suggestion of fetal malformations or anything like that. And another thing to know about a medication like rituximab is that the half 
half-life is about 22 days, which means that really the, the medication will, you know, will be out of your, your system within a, a couple months. So I often tell my patients that, you know, maybe trying to conceive three and a half to four months after your last infusion is probably fine. But we, you know, we don't have all the data here. So it's still an evolving field. What you just said about rituximab, though, is at least really reassuring is that you can be on um, what many consider an effective or helpful NMO treatment to help reduce disease activity and still maybe time it just right so that you have the ability to conceive if you're planning um, appropriately. I have one question on that. So would you then have the patient, if in between their infusions, try to conceive, would they then receive their next infusion while pregnant or would they wait after they gave birth? So it, it really depends on the patient. Mm-hmm. And this, again, NMO is such an individual disease and, and, and so heterogeneous in the way it presents and relapse activity, et cetera. And so these decisions need to be made um, on an individual basis with mm-hmm. each patient and her, her physician. Makes sense. And so I think you were about to go through another potential DMT and what we know about safety and pregnancy. Well, I was just going to say that azathioprine is another medication that many NMO patients are commonly on. And that also seems to be safe during pregnancy. Like A lot of the data we have on azathioprine in pregnancy does not come from NMO patients, Mm -hmm. however, so we are extrapolating in that way. And similarly, you know, there's medi- there are medications that we absolutely would not want patients to get pregnant on. So those medications are methotrexate and, meth- and mycophenolate. Ah. Both have been shown, at least in other populations, to increase the risk of fetal malformations, meaning that the baby has may have abnormal appearance or abnormal organ development. So we really do try to avoid these therapies. And similar to sort of the whole conversation, we really actually want to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. But in the case of mycophenolate, you would want to be off of that for a month or so before you even started to conceive. And then it would actually be months, like three months or more. So this is just goes back to our planning. Yes, planning is definitely key. Would it ever be a consideration if a patient was on one of those more do not get pregnant on medications like mycophenolate or methotrexate, would you ever have them stop that treatment and then switch to another one if that was okay to conceive on? Yeah, I think that would be a totally reasonable approach to things. And the counseling that we do surrounding this would be very individual and really would probably depend on how stable they had been on a particular medication Mm -hmm. and all these individual factors. But I think it's a good point and an idea we would certainly consider in many patients. Super interesting. And the only other thing I want to add to is I know we're talking about getting pregnant and, and fertility, but for patients who are on methotrexate mm-hmm. and mycophenolate, because of the dangers during during pregnancy, it is important to be on effective birth control. Ah, uh, yes. I think that's definitely something that animal patients need to be aware of and empowered by and have a conversations, I'm assuming, with their OBGYN and to find the most appropriate and effective contraception for them. Right. And I do want to point out, this because we, we should say something about men in, in all mm-hmm. of this, there has there have been some suggestions that baby methotrexate might decrease the, some aspects of fertility amongst men, and but this is not consistent. And similarly for mycophenolate, there may be some suggestion of this amongst men. So I think it's reasonable for men, too, if they're thinking about having a child to bring up what disease-modifying therapy they're on with their provider and just check and make sure that, that it's safe and that they think it's okay for them to stay on that medication. Thanks, Dr. Galetta. That's a really good point. And kind of similarly, do we know any potential effects of treatment exposure to the female partners of male patients being treated? I don't think we really know yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's still working on the first step, I think, is really trying <laughs> to understand even methotrexate on the men themselves. Despite the fact that methotrexate is used actually in a number of different disease conditions, I don't think we have it totally worked out, even whether or not it's causing infertility, but there may be some suggestion that it it could, really in the way that the sperm themselves can move. I see. Once an individual with NMO is pregnant, what then? So as I understand, it seems that pregnancy doesn't seem to be protective in NMO. So what's the overall incidence rate of relapses during pregnancy? Do we know? How do we treat them? So we don't necessarily know the incidence rate of relapse. And as Dr. Galetta mentioned earlier, the data is a little conflicting, whether relapses are sort of stable or maybe even increased. But Mm -hmm. the good news is that 
that we do know how to treat them. Awesome. IV steroids in particular, uh, methylprednisolone is the preferred steroid because it's metabolized before it even crosses the placenta. And that has been shown to be safe, particularly in second and third trimester. There's a suggestion that it may be associated with cleft palate when used in the first trimester, but we're not exactly sure about this as, as well because there's some data also from patients with asthma who've used inhaled corticosteroids all through their first trimester and, and didn't have an issue. But in general, we prefer to use steroids in the second and third trimester. IVIG is also thought to be safe during pregnancy. And even plasmapheresis, there's plenty of case series and case reports of, of pregnant women receiving plasmapheresis. Again, these are not case series or case reports of NMO patients, mm-hmm. um, but they're patients from uh, within other disease states. And we sort of extrapolated upon that, that data. I think overall that is reassuring that even if you're going to have disease activity while pregnant, that it can be managed. Are there any other complications that we should be aware of during pregnancy? Yeah, I think the big complications that we're starting to notice are are with the Mm preeclampsia and then also higher rates of miscarriage amongst patients with NMO. And do we know the why? I'm guessing guessing we need more data, but the, the cause and effect potential and the increased rate of miscarriage? Well, it may have something to do with where the aquaporin 4 uh, channel is located in the mm. body because it, it is located around the placenta. So that may be related to miscarriage. As far as I know, I don't think we have a, bet, a great understanding exactly why the preeclampsia is higher amongst animal patients. But I think we're, we're on the verge of understanding both of those things in the next in the coming years. Well, that's hopeful and exciting. Dr. Galetta, could you help explain to our listeners the definition of preeclampsia and just why is it something that we should be concerned about? Yeah, there's really three main symptoms that we see with preeclampsia, and it's high blood pressure, falling of the hands and feet, and protein in the urine. So general ob guide visits, you'll probably notice that they're checking all of, for all of these things. <laughs> uh-huh. um, the reason why it's concerning is because that can really lead to bad outcomes for mom and baby if things get out of control in many different ways that that can play out, which is why, again, collaboration is so important between neurologists and also OB-GYN just to make sure that everything is is under control. And preeclampsia is a fairly common pregnancy complication even amongst patients who don't have NMO. And so many high-risk OB-GYNs feel very confident in, in handling these issues. Okay, well, I think that's really good to know. So it's not like it's something that is specific to NMO or that NMO hikes up that much. It's overall common and manageable. Exactly. Okay, great. What about at the end of pregnancy, so postpartum delivery? Anything that we need to know there that for NMO patients? The main issue is sort of what we've touched on before, that there is this risk of of relapse in the postpartum period, specifically in that immediate postpartum period. And maybe this is due partly to this huge drop in hormones. You know, estrogen and progesterone have been very high all through pregnancy, and then suddenly they plummet. And that can cause changes in the immune system, too. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that patients are aware of this and physicians are aware of this. And the more knowledge we have, the better able we are to, to treat this. Just any woman who wants to conceive, she tends to have a birth plan. So those with NMO, um, a part of their birth plan would be their NMO management plan. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, this, to me, has been really reassuring and I hope empowering for people, whether women with NMO who would like to conceive or are pregnant now or men who want to be fathers someday who are living with NMO. I think that this is really reassuring and that it is possible. They just have to be open and willing to collaborate, coordinate with their healthcare providers. Absolutely. And it just, you know, it takes some careful planning and a team approach, but it can be done. Thank you so much for your expertise on this. Once again, Dr. Kaplan, thank you for sharing with us. And Dr. Galetta, it's been really awesome to have your input on here as well on what I think is a really important topic. And on our next episode, we're planning to go to the next step of the timeline, which would be parenting. We can get into some other fun conversations there too. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Chelsea. What a great discussion I had with Dr. Galetta and Dr. Kaplan. So grateful to them. 
And thank you listeners once again for following along with us. I hope you found this information on family planning with NMO helpful. Please give us a review on our podcast, whether you're listening on iTunes or tune in and let us know your feedback. What do you want to hear? How could we do better? We're really excited to hear from you. You can do that at the Sumire Foundation's website, sumirefoundation.org or connorbjudgefoundation.org. You can also find us on social media at the Sumire Foundation or the Connor B. Judge Foundation. We're at CBJVNMO. Thank you so much, and we hope that you follow again with us next time.